Good morning. This is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. My voice is still a little weak from a head cold. I caught on vacation and then some preaching that I did rather uh, passionately. Uh, but today, in our chapter by chapter study of the Bible, we are looking at Deuteronomy chapter 31. Now, I want to introduce you to some more of my friends, my, my books, and uh, I showed you the Hebrew, Greek, English, intralinear Bible, and what that is, is the original languages interspersed uh, with one another, showing the grammar of the ancient languages with the English version in the margins. Very useful Bible. I've got a, I showed you the Dakes, annotated Bible. Dake was the only, and I'm not selling any of this. This is not in my store. This is just me uh, bringing you just a little closer as a digital friend. Uh, Dake was the only spirit-baptized commentator who who spoke in tongues, who wrote a commentary at that those times, those decades, and this century when most of the great commentaries were written, and he was one, and he has a very interesting perspective. Now, I've got something else to show you. This is a loose-leaf Bible. It's a loose-leaf Bible with a uh, Somewhat wide margins for note taking, uses a five ring binder. And this is really great for taking specific chapters out and setting them aside, our specific books, and studying through them in correlation with consulting the other books. And of course, for everything that I have in my library physically, I have probably a hundred times that digitally. I use the, I happen to like the Olive Tree Bible that you can find at olivetree.com. The thing I like about it is that you can look at the notes that you make and the text of the scripture at the first, at the same time. Uh, that To me, that's always been the gold standard of Bible programs. I've used Bible programs since before Windows when there were only DOS operating systems on computers that were about half the size of this desk. And there was an online Bible, DOS-based. If you've ever used it, I want you to email me, let me know, russellwalden at gmail.com, R-U-S-S-E-L-L-W-A-L-D-E-N. Because if you have used David Pierce's DOS-based online Bible, then you and I are a part of a, a rather... Uh, unique antiquarian society who would even remember David Pierce and the online Bible. But what's interesting about it, almost every digital Bible that's come after David Pierce, he did the first one, uh, it uses his text, particularly in the King James, because he had volunteers type up the Bible and then they did all this proofreading. But there were certain... Uh, typographical errors in David's uh, transcriptions by the various volunteers, and I used that digital Bible so much, I, I knew and could turn to and find those proofreading errors. And so if I pick up one of the latest and greatest, best and brightest Bibles, whether it's physical or digital, I can flip through and say, no matter what their claim to fame is, they built upon the sacrifice and the devotion of David Pierce working so long ago before Windows, before cell phones, or any of this. And so I hope you don't mind me sharing that with you. Uh, as I said, these books are almost like my friends. They've been with me a long time, given me a lot of pleasure, a lot of insight into God's Word. And so today we are studying Deuteronomy chapter 31. Preparing to cross over. Are you ready to cross over? Like the Lord said, you've dwelt in this mountain long enough. 
Are you ready to cross over in your life? In this chapter, Moses continues to finalize the affairs of Israel before his death. Now, what was the key when we talk about Moses' death? We have to consider his longevity. What was the key to Moses' long life? Does God's presence, such as it impacted Moses, does it still attend us? Is it still on us today, potentially lengthening our lives as it did Moses? I'm going to give you an example of that that I'm familiar with. Does the presence of God extend life? You know, Ecclesiastes talks about death from looking at it from the other side, uh, from the dimension of the spirit, and describes a silver cord that is cut. And in the scriptures, you can find reference to God lengthening your cords and strengthening your tent stakes. Let me tell you something. The, the, that which is spoken poetically as the silver cord of your life expectancy put in you by God can be lengthened if you have faith to receive that. So how long can you as a believer expect to live? Can you change your life expectancy through your proximity to the presence of God? And then we'll get into why did God reject Moses for striking the rock? What was the rock's significance that Moses struck? Are the first five books of the Bible the only true canon or the only canon closed by God himself? The canon is like a closed set of Bible books. And, uh, and God, through Moses, did in fact close the canon of the first five books of the Bible. We have to really look through history to determine the closing of the canon, and I'm not saying we don't have a closed canon for those of you that are scholars, uh, but the point I'm making is that in this chapter, God himself, through Moses, closes the canon of the Pentateuch himself, and it's the only record we really have of a definitive closing of the canon in the Old Testament or the New. Uh, listen to what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. Um, all of these questions are addressed in our study. Now again, this is Deuteronomy 31. It's 30 verses. We're going to read the entire chapter, and then we'll make our comments. And Moses went and spake these words to all Israel, and he said unto them, I'm 120 years old uh, this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord has said to me that I will not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God, he will go over before you, and he will destroy the nations before you, and you will possess them, and Joshua, he will go over before you as the Lord has said. And the Lord shall do to them as he did to Sihon and to Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them which he destroyed. And the Lord will give them up before your face, that you may do to them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God he it is that goes before you. He will not fail you, nor forsake you. And Moses called to Joshua and said to him in sight of all of Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for you must go with this people into the land, which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you will cause them, Joshua, you will cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that goes before you, Joshua. He will be with you. He will not fail you, nor forsake you. So God's not going to fail Israel. He's not going to fail Joshua. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Verse 9. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, during the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, when all Israel has come to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose, you will read this law before all of Israel. So you see here, God is, through Moses, is closing the canon of the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Gather the people together, men, women, children, the stranger that is in your gates, that they may hear, that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law. Now notice that they were supposed to gather all the people, including the people that had immigrated into Israel. See, that's the thing that we haven't done. That's where the nation, the United States has utterly failed. Because when this nation was predominantly a Christian nation, we allowed all of these cultures to pour into the melting pot of this nation 
but we did not um, familiarize them with the God of the Judeo-Christian uh, foundation, the God of the Bible. We let them come in and like King Solomon allowed all of his 900 concubines and 400 wives worship all their pagan gods and they corrupted his heart. So instead of uh, training and discipling the nations that came to us into the ways of God, we adopted their idols and our nation is in the condition that it is today. So that their children, verse 13, that have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord as long as you live in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, your days approach that you will die. Call Joshua, present yourselves to the tabernacle of the congregation, that I might give him, Joshua, a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will sleep with your fathers. He's going to die. And this people will rise up and go whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land. So you can see he told them to teach the strangers, and God is telling Moses what you just told them to do, they're not going to do. And God says when strangers come into your land and you adopt their ways instead of discipling them in the ways of God, God calls that nation as having gone a whoring after other gods. This is what we call diversity today. God calls whoredom. Are you listening? Um, and God says, then will my anger be kindled against them, for I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they will be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall fall upon them. So they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? Now look at the point. God is not among them. As Martin Luther said, in Christ is grace. Outside of Christ is the law. The law hasn't evaporated. Jesus stated that plainly. And outside of that which originates in Christ, the law dictates. The anger of God has not ceased to exist. It exists where it has always existed, outside of Christ. But yet we have the invitation to come into Christ. Are you listening? So, God says in verse 18, he said, I'm going to Hide my face that day from all the evils which they have wrought, and in the day they turn to other gods adopted from those that immigrated into Israel. Now, therefore, write this song and teach it to your children and put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Now, he's referring to what we're going to focus on in the next chapter. For when I will have brought them into the land, which I swear unto their fathers, that flows with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves in wax and fat, then they will turn to other gods, and they will serve them and provoke them, and they will break my covenant. When in this nation, the United States, did all of these unfortunate events take place, such as uh, gender uh, recognition of same-sex marriages and all this kind of stuff, you know when it happened? Much of what is plaguing this nation today and bringing this nation, if something doesn't happen to the brink of civil war, it began under the Clinton administration when the national debt, I'm sorry, under the Bush administration when the national debt was paid off. When the national debt was paid off, it seemed that an avalanche of amoral principles flooded this country. And he's saying here, whenever they've waxed and fat, when all these things have happened, instead of being thankful, they break the covenant. And it will come to pass, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song will testify as a witness against them, that it not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination that they go about even now before I brought them into the land which I swear. So where is the song? They have the song of Moses. Where is the song of national repentance in our nation? Where is our song? Of repentance. For well, what do I have to repent for? Nehemiah repented for the transgression of his nation as though they were his own. So when do we repent over homosexuality, same-sex marriage, and all of this that's going on around us? Where are we repenting? Those of us that claim to understand that it needs to happen. It's not about pointing the finger. It's about bending the knee. God help us. 
Verse 22, therefore Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua a charge, be strong and of a good courage, for you will bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear to you. And it shall come to pass when Moses had made an end of the words of the law in a book until they were finished, closed canon, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark, take this book of the law and put it in the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be a witness there. For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck, while I am yet alive with you this day. You've been rebellious against the Lord, how much more so after my death. Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes. Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will fall upon you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And Moses spake in the ears of the children of Israel uh, the words of this song till it would end. You know, and there's so much cowardice in church culture today. No one is making. I haven't heard since COVID broke out and millions have died. I have not heard one bona fide voice of leadership in the culture of the kingdom that has made even the most remote connection <coughs> with a plague of biblical proportions affecting the entire earth with the sins of mankind. Oh, that, oh, we don't want to talk about sin. God doesn't do like that anymore. Yes, he does. Outside of Christ, it's exactly what he does within Christ, to whom he has given ample invitation to all within Christ is the ark of safety. So let's think about these things because I can't think of anything that's more relevant. Back to the beginning of our chapter, and let's talk about Moses. Longevity. What an amazing thing that Moses lived so long and was vital enough to lead two million people in a refugee situation to a new land. And in all that time, it said his strength endured. Even his eyesight did not suffer the ravages of age. He hello, um, I'm wearing glasses. Uh, how long can you expect your, your lifespan to be? Is this mention of Moses just poetic license of an ancient writer and not an actual fact. Now, you ask anyone who considers themselves and uh, to have erudition, you have a scholarly knowledge of the Bible, say, well, that's, that's not literal. And all that is, is unbelief. Do you know the global life expectancy of everybody on the earth, both men and women in all nations in 2012 was 70. That was the average age of natural death. In the, when we just consider the Western world, life expectancy ranges between 79 in the U.S. and 82 in Canada. The longest life expectancy in the world is 84 in Japan. In Moses' day, now get this, people don't realize this, in Moses' day, the life expectancy on the average was 30 years of age, and Moses lived four times longer than that. So obviously Moses was affected by something beyond the norm. In Exodus 34, 29 through 35, we find that when Moses spent time in God's presence, his face would shine with an unusual luminescence. The halos depicted around the saints and the divines in ancient art were not some manufactured something. It suggests something of the presence of God that had been witnessed throughout the centuries that had an impact on the physical appearance, and no doubt included, for the person experiencing it, residual health effects. Well, what am I saying? What would that look like today? Here's what that would look like today. I'll never forget, in the second church that I pastored, we were having a massive move of God, and I was bringing a Sunday morning message one day, and suddenly a, a, a woman begins to shout. She says, I can't see your face. I can hear you talking, but I can't see your face. All I see is a fire coming. And then someone else jumped up and said, I see angels in the four corners of the room. What, what were they seeing? I didn't see anything. 
but there was something being witnessed to, and I believe that something is not intended to be a Holy Ghost parlor trick to keep church people from being bored on Sunday. It's something that you and I are supposed to abide in that impacts every aspect of our life, including our longevity. Else, why did Jesus say, he that believeth on me should never die? He made an unambiguous statement, he, and he did not qualify it as a metaphor. I'm talking about spiritual life, and this is only spiritual. This has nothing to do with the physical. That's unbelief. The scripture says Enoch, by faith, was translated. By faith. In other words, he heard a message, believed it, and got translated. We think there's going to be some big theological button in God's timeline that's going to be punched, and everybody that signed a salvation card is going to heaven. Let me tell you something. We'll put on immortality because somebody's preaching immortality. And we'll have faith mixed with that message. And we will experience something of which Moses experienced in a measure we will experience in fullness. There will be a generation on the earth that will experience this in fullness. I believe that with all my heart. When Martin Luther King said, I may not go there with you. But mark my word, there will be a day, as the scripture reveals to us, that this is going to happen. So, if you accept the fact that we're living in a New Testament dispensation, forget Moses for a minute, look in two passages in Acts. In Acts 2-3, there was a luminescence like fire that came on the 120 when God's presence came in the upper room at Pentecost. At the martyrdom of Stephen, we read in Acts 6.15, that all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him, on Stephen's face, saw his face shine as though it had been the face of an angel. Help is God. I personally, here's my example. I personally worked under a minister who preached almost every day. Now listen, he literally preached almost every day for 50 years. That man is in his 90s now, and he has not one gray hair. You got to understand, he, he started preaching in 1953, and he's still preaching today, almost every day. And he has not one gray hair on his head, not one wrinkle on his face. The presence of God has an effect on our health that we have yet to fully comprehend. But it impacts health and it impacts longevity. Of course, even in the midst of Moses' testimony of longevity, there is an acknowledgement that he disobeyed by striking the rock in Numbers 20, verse 10. Because he struck the rock, he's not going to be allowed to lead the people into the land of promise, so Moses, Moses picks Joshua. Now, why did Moses get in so much trouble for striking the rock? Because striking the rock the second time, which caused all the problem, violated a type and shadow God was creating about that spoke about Jesus. See, the first time Moses struck the rock, that represented Jesus being crucified. The second time he was to speak to the rock. So Jesus was crucified, and then speaking takes place called preaching the gospel. And then we receive the message spoken, and the third time when they needed water out of the rock, the people just gathered and sang. You picture this. Moses, the first time, he struck the rock, and, and Paul said, that rock was Christ. And Jesus was smitten, and the waters of salvation came out. The second time, he was just supposed to speak to it, because we don't have to crucify Jesus again. Just preach the gospel, and those waters will flow. But now, the third time, that water was needed from the rock. Moses wasn't striking. They weren't speaking to the rock. That's what Moses was supposed to do the second time, and he didn't. He got in trouble. The third time, two million people gathered, and they sang to the rock in Numbers 21, 17. And they said, spring up, O well. And the water came forth. Oh, I don't know about you, but that moves my heart. Because again, 1 Corinthians 10, 4 tells us Jesus is that rock. Paul said, we all drink that same drink, for they drink of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. 
So Jesus was in type and shadow the first time smitten by Moses as a representative of the law. The Jews crucified Jesus and Jesus paid for our sins. Then through the second time, the preaching of the gospel, God's leader speaks to the rock. Moses disobeyed that and got in trouble, supposedly to speak to the rock, bringing the message of salvation in the waters of salvation flow. And then the third time, the corporate body of Christ, which has been completely abandoned by evangelical church culture to cause an audience. And we're doing church's entertainment and church's performance. And we've lost the, the third, the electrified third rail of the body of Christ. And the, the people are singing to the rock and the waters of life flow corporately. And those of us diehards from the charismatic revival in the 60s and 70s, we remember corporate body life, body ministry. Today, there's very little of it in evidence. But we sure do have smoke machines. We have, we have great performances. We bring the lights down low. It's dark church. But lives are not being transformed to the degree they could be. In verse 10, Moses commands that the law be read every seven years at the culmination of the Feast of Tabernacles. This included reading the entire Pentateuch. Now, there is no record that they ever did this. To read the entire Pentateuch, bring all the people from all over Israel, go to Jerusalem and stand up, and we're going to read five books of the Bible. Man, read five verses if somebody wants to sit down. Um, we do have record that the law was received, but very little verification in ancient history that it was followed or obeyed in this and many other examples of disobedience. The people then, much as is true today, they were hearers of the word, but not doers. And this answers the question as to why so much of the promise to the people was not fulfilled in the centuries between Moses and Jesus. See, the people, the Jews, presumed that being the curators of the law suffice enough. And don't we do that? We think if we're curators of the testimony of the Bible, which we don't often read, we read Facebook more than the Bible. Uh, if we're just curators of it, then that's enough. And it wasn't enough in Jesus' day, and it's not enough now. In verse 14, God commands Moses to take Joshua, go into the cloud of glory that always appeared at the door. And it wasn't a smoke machine. This cloud always appeared at the door of the tabernacle. And what is the door? In John 10, 7 through 9, Jesus identifies himself as the door. This is where the voice of God was always heard and guidance was always given. The scriptures teach us that our bodies are the tabernacle and that Jesus, the door, lives in our heart. See, the glory doesn't just visit a building or a tent now. It abides in us. God wants us to consult him in the cloud at the door that is in us. And then Moses is instructed to compose a song to give the people to remember important things that he's imparting right before his death. And of course, in, in verse 24, in the midst of that, Moses makes an end of writing the law. And it's the example of God himself closing the canon. If we say, where was the canon closed? You'll hear a lot of suggestions, but one unequivocal closing of the canon was God closing the canon of the first five books of the Bible. The Jews don't accept all of the other books as what we would say canonical or authoritative. We accept 66 books of the Bible, but you'll have a hard time not saying that we have an open canon, but you'll have a hard time finding a definitive closing of the New Testament canon, or even the 66 books of the Old and New Testament in Christian tradition, you have a really hard time finding a definitive closing of the canon in church history. It certainly is not recorded in the Bible. And it's something we need to think about. Why? Because there are those that say, sola scriptura, the Bible alone is all we need. That's a lie. Because if the Bible was all we need, how come he led captivity captive and imparted gifts unto men called apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher? If the Bible is all we need, why did he say, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost? Why did you send the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost? He didn't send Gutenberg to give them a book. He sent the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. I'm not marginalizing the scripture. What I am saying is that sola scriptura 
is is inaccurate. We need, I believe, this is the infallible word of God without question, but we need in that, we need the church, we need the gifts of the Spirit, we need the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, we need the fivefold ministry. So we need to be careful not to ensconce the scriptures in this religious gilding of unbelief because we don't want to be responsible to seek the whole counsel of God in its full spectrum of manifestation in our midst because we say, well, we got a Bible, which we don't even read. Thank you for tuning in for the broadcast. If this broadcast has blessed you, I, I would ask to hear from you. My email is Russell Walden, R-U-S-S-E-L-L-W-A-L-D-E-N at Gmail. If this message has been a blessing to you, would you support us financially? The scripture says plainly, if, if you are receiving spiritual things from the word, it's appropriate to sow back natural things like money to further to the furtherance of the ability to do this. You can text the word morning to 44321 and you'll get a link to give specifically to the morning light broadcast. You can also uh, uh, do Cash App. Cash App is uh, dollar sign prophetic now. You can do Zelle, if you have Zelle, if you know what that is, to 417-332-7749. And you can go to the website and, and on the donation links you can give through PayPal and uh, through Square, through the donation availabilities there, or you could call our office at 417-593-9802 and Georgette or Katie would be glad to help you make a donation over the phone, or you could send a donation to Father's Heart Ministry, P.O. Box 1915, Branson, Missouri, 65615. Uh, why am I shamelessly bringing up a giving opportunity? Because I believe in what I do. And if you've listened this far in this Bible study, I think you believe in something that's, that's being presented here. What do you give? Listen to the Holy Ghost. Let the Holy Ghost prompt you right now and then do that right now. Don't wait. Don't fold your hands and say, I'll get to it next week, because your response time to God is a metric of his response time to you. You want God to act fast? Then, then obey that prompting. Obey the prompting of the Holy Ghost in a timely manner. And thank you so much for supporting us.